So I thought it was appropriate with it being Reformation Sunday. Now, Reformation Day is actually Halloween. It's uh, October 31st, but we usually have a Sunday around that that we call Reformation Sunday that we can be able to celebrate that time. And it's, as I said before, it's not just a Scottish tradition. It's, it's all different uh, matters of the Reformation that uh, everybody can kind of put themselves back in, in, the, in the linear genealogy, so to speak, of what they believe to that time. Uh, however, the, ref the reformers changed the trajectory in a lot of ways of Western society. And I would argue even they even changed the trajectory of much of the world. And you're like, okay, that's saying a lot. How do they change things in far-flung parts of the world? Well, here's an example that things that precipitated from that time. One of the things that happened during the Reformation is that they, they said, you know what? It's very clear to us that we're supposed to be reading God's holy word. We're supposed to be reading the Bible. And guess what? Most people can't read. I bet guess we better teach them. That was a huge difference. So all of public education, modern education, has due back to then. Now, were people educated before that? Yes, the wealthy paid great sums of money to be able to go to a place to be able to, but most people didn't learn those. Most people are illiterate. On top of the fact that most of the time when they went to Mass at the time, it was all in Latin, and they didn't know Latin. So they didn't know what was going on. They were just and literally standing the entire time. There weren't pews for the most part back then. They stood the entire time, and then when it came time to be able to do the Eucharist, which is the Lord's Supper, they would ring the bell to make sure everybody was awake and knew what was going on. It was a really fascinating time in a lot of ways. Now, all that said, during that time, there were a lot of very pious people. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like everybody had veered off, but the leadership of the church, and there was just at that time, I'll say one church, in that area, certainly one church. Yes, you have Eastern Orthodox in different area. But for that area, there was really just one church. And so the reformers wanted to reform the church. Uh, however, Luther, as I said before, didn't really talk people into leaving the Roman Catholic Church so much as the people were already ready to leave. Calvin really didn't so define some sort of new Christianity as, as really continually pointing to the scripture and saying, this is what the scripture says it's supposed to be. So you see the reformers were saying, we want to reform. We want to get back to the faith. All of the reformers had a part, yes, but they kind of facilitated a return to the foundational truths of the Bible, something that that if, if there was something that the Holy Spirit was doing through them, that was it. It wasn't that it was defining something new. It was the Holy Spirit was working through them to say we need to get back to where we were. Now, there were many reformers. I'm going to spend a little time talking about Luther. Now, Luther obviously is not the only reformer. However, you're going to say, let's talk about the Protestant Reformation, and you don't mention Luther. You miss something big. So Luther, and that's not Lex Luther, and that's not Martin Luther King. It's Martin Luther, and he lived in, the, and he basically lived right about 1500. And he's an interesting guy. He's an important reformer, as I said, and he basically started it all. Perhaps all of Western society has been impacted or affected by those few strokes of a pen that he wrote down, and he, that nail, and that hammer, and that Wittenberg door that he nailed them to. He started something. He essentially was the spark, though. We can identify with that here in California, right? A wildfire. I mean, it's not that the person is the fire on themselves, but the spark that starts what already is there. Now, I'm not going to compare the good that happened out of the Reformation as the bad that comes out of a wildfire, but it's that same sort of concept that when it, once it catches on, the tinder, uh, the, 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 the dryness, everything was ready to set fires, to set a blaze. And so Luther basically put that on there and he says, hey, we need to talk about this stuff. And that was a typical way you do. You, you post your, he had 95 theses he put up there and uh, uh, different uh, ideas and things he wanted to talk about. He put them up there and that started the world ablaze. Well, Luther, in case you start to hold him up in too high regard, Luther was not a perfect person. He was just a man. He'd be the first to admit that. He was just a man. He wasn't so much of a creator as he was a reformer. He wasn't so much of a modernizer. He wasn't trying to revamp something, but he, was try he actually kind of rediscovered. He was a rediscoverer. So what did he discover? Well, before I get to what he discovered, I'll tell you that in just a little bit. Let's remember at that time, 
what was going on, the egregiences of the papal offenses and so forth that were going on. At that time, the Roman Catholic Church was the only game in town. And during that time when those lapses in the church were happening in the papacy, he, there's many, and I won't go into the whole history, but many times when he's seen this, he's looking around and he's saying, this is what faith is? This is what we're all about? So if somebody wanted to be really pious, they really wanted to be able to be near to the Lord, they might become a monk or they might become uh, some sort of a, so, a priest or somebody involved with the church. And so many were looking around and saying, this is it. But how do you affect that when the leadership has fallen apart? Now the other thing about Luther is that Luther had a probably overdeveloped sense of his own guilt. Now I would say that 99% of people in the world have an underdeveloped sense of their own guilt. So that's it. He had an overdeveloped or maybe a rightly developed. He really felt guilty. Even about things that we wouldn't even necessarily say, hey, it's okay, you can take a day off. But he felt guilty. He felt the weight of his own sin. It, it held him down, his own guilt, his own faults. And he's looking at this and saying, the church is telling me that to be just, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this to, be, to earn my salvation. I need to do this. I can, I can spend this. I can pay this. I can tell people that they need to do this. They need to walk up the steps on their, knee, on their knees and say Hail Marys or whatever the church was saying. They were selling indulgences at the time to try and raise money to build a new cathedral. And they said, hey, if you buy these, you'll spring people out of hell. And you do love your ancestors, right? They, there was a lot of real poor theology at that time. And he was looking around and said, this can't be it. Now, the other thing that he realized is he realized that from what he could see, there was nothing he could do to ever fully pay for all that he did. His own fault, his own guilt. And then he comes across Romans 1 17. And he would say that was what he came across. I'm not just saying that's something he read. He came across that. Now, you say, well, what's the big deal? He was just reading his Bible. Well, most monks back then did not read the Bible. Most people back then, even the leadership of the church, did not read the Bible. To this day, the Roman Catholic Church does not put a lot of emphasis on reading the Bible. There's more than there used to be. At that time, they basically, at that time in the Roman Catholic Church, they said, you shouldn't be reading your own Bible, even if you can, because, you know, you'll misinterpret it. And we have a much different understanding in Protestant uh, uh, theology of how the Holy Spirit helps to illumine the text. I get that. But don't gloss over that and understand that. At that time, they were saying, you shouldn't be reading your Bible. You shouldn't be, except for the elite. Well, Luther had a, a law degree. He had a background. He was intelligent. Eventually, he, he taught others, and he was reading these things. I understand what it's saying, and that's not what the church looks like. Romans 1.17, as he's reading through that, and he's, as he's reading through that, he's saying, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, this is 16, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And as he was reading through this, he was suddenly impacted by this being the word of God. Thanks be to God. But as he was better educated and he read this, he saw something that was new, something that was long missing from the church, but yet wasn't new. It was something new to him, something new to the church at the time, but not new to Christ's church. Something that the word of God said plainly, but that he had never heard in that way before, never thought about that before. Luther heard the gospel. He read Romans 1, 17, and it changed everything for him. He saw his sin differently, not escape in its inescapable, not something that he would always be held in, but redeemable. He saw God differently, not just as a scary, wrathful God, but a God who loves his people so much to create a way for them to be saved. He saw the solution to sin differently. It was something which all people felt, even from the ancient of times. Can, can a few penance 
actions really redeem the blood I've shed, the wrongs that I've done? Can the blood of a goat or a bull shed me of my guilt? No, can going to confession shed me of all of my guilt truly? Can, can going up the steps of the Scalia Sancta and praying the Hail Mary really pay for my sins or the sins of the person next to me? Is there something, is there really anything that we can truly do to pay for our sins? And the answer is yes. We can die for them because that's what sin does. Sin engenders the death. The very notion of sin engenders engenders death. Death comes with sin. Something has to die to be able to redeem sin. And that's a scary thing when you think about the wrath of God. And at that time, up until that time, Luther had been so scared. He'd almost, in his words, hated God for the wrath of God to him was inescapable. So in Romans 1.17, as he's reading this, this is written by the Apostle Paul. It echoed something Paul had emphasized before in Galatians and something that was picked up at another point in, in the book of Hebrews, all which pointed back to Habakkuk 2.4 in the Old Testament, which said, the just shall live by faith. The just meaning the righteous person. The righteous person will live by faith. And as Luther contemplated this, these words, these words stuck with him as he prayed, the, the terms playing out the implications of that in his mind. The just shall live by faith. Is it really that simple, he was asking himself. Could these few words change everything? Because everything looks so different now that I understand that the just shall live by faith. Now, as I said, Luther hadn't discovered this. He really had more rediscovered this as he read through the Bible. The gospel that had been lost and pushed aside, set aside by the church at the time, the truth that undergirded all the good things of the church and decimated all the appalling things about the church. These few words changed everything for Luther. The just shall live by faith. And Luther describes this in his own words. He says, I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant. Night and day I pondered until I saw that connection between the justice of God and the statement, the just shall live by faith. And then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through sheer grace and mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors to paradise. The whole of Scripture took on new meaning, and whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, it now became inexpressibly sweet in greater love. And the passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. You see, Luther had grasped the centrality of the gospel in a way that had long been lost by the church within the confines of the church politics, the wranglings, and the institutionalization of the church. And suddenly, everything looked so different now, and he would never be the same. And much of Western society and the world would never be the same again. But what does this mean for us? Is it just history? Do these words from Roman 117 and Luther's uh, experience with these, are, are they just a nice little footnote? Or do they mean something for us as well? Do they still speak to us today? Does Romans 117 still apply and help us today? Well, perhaps you feel pressed down under the weight of your sin or guilt, inexpressible You may realize or think about the fact that tears shed will not fix our mistakes. We cannot just work it off, as the world would tell us, as if God was expected to be one big community service to work off our guilt. You realize that we will always be responsible for our wrongs, whether they be harsh words to a loved one, ignoring those who are in need, betraying our friends, giving into our passions or our greed at the time. There is blood on our hands. And that's sin. And nothing we do ourselves can take it away. But what does the Bible say? It says the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? No, faith in whom? Faith in Christ Jesus. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness. Nothing in ourselves can earn our way out. John Calvin compared this, the the righteousness of man, he says, is just a vapor 
It's like, it's like a nothingness compared to the righteousness of God. Another way to think of it is that we're in this thin, deep hole, and all we have in our hand is a shovel, and we can't dig our way out. We can only dig ourselves deeper. Another way to look at it is, is, is that Christ's righteousness is white righteousness, and our righteousness is at one time white and then stained with our sin, stained with our sinful nature. And once, a, a, if you had a bucket of paint, if you had a, let's say, let's just say a, a, a small pint or whatever they sell them in, of paint, and it's, it's lily white, pure as snow, And then in comes the sin, and it makes it darker and darker. How can we, ourselves, with what our righteousness, how can we make that whiter in and of ourselves? It doesn't matter how much of ourselves we add to ourselves, we can never make ourselves whiter. And yet, Christ's righteousness is white. And so it would be like if we took that, that small can of paint and put it within the bigger can of the whiteness, the white paint of Jesus, and we sit it in there, and then God looks at that bigger can of paint. I was going to do an example up here, and I thought, paint on the uh, carpet would not look good. But you look at this can of paint, and you put the other one inside, and all you do is you see the white. Let's say it's a clear can of paint. All you do is see the white, and you don't see. It's because Christ's righteousness shed, or it covers over us. We trust not in works to be justified. We trust in Christ Jesus through faith. Romans 4, 5 says, I think I have it here. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. We can be just. We can be righteous in God's eyes, not because of the works that we do. We can't depend on those. The more we depend on those, the more we look to ourselves to solve a problem we can never solve. We need to look to Christ through faith, for Christ is the only one who can save our problem of sin. And we realize that God is still a just God. He always will be. That our sin still needs to be punished but we realize, as Luther did, that our heavenly and holy Father is not just a, simply a God of wrath, but a Father that also loves us so much that he provides us escape from his own wrath over sin by sending his Son to die in our place. The wrath goes upon Jesus rather than us. Jesus died that we might be saved. The just shall live by faith. So here's a question for us. Does it look different to you now? Does your guilt and your shame and your punishment, does it look different to you now? Now that you understand that our righteousness, our being just is not by works, but through faith. Perhaps it's something that you knew a long time ago, but you haven't felt recently. Maybe this is the first time you've ever thought about it. First time you've even heard it. Maybe it suddenly comes upon you like it did with Luther. It changes everything. Does everything look different to you now? And when Luther, when he read Romans 1.17 with that fresh light, those few words changed everything for Luther and much of history after him. Have they changed everything for you? Have they changed you? They should. They did for Luther. They have for me. And I sincerely hope that they change you too. Because if you realize the meaning of the just shall live by faith, everything will look different for you now, too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those words that remind us that the just shall live by faith, that we go through life thinking that we can put on the righteousness that the world tells us we can do, that we can be better, that we can earn our way that we just will go to heaven just because we're a good person, right? And the Bible gives us no such picture whatsoever. The Bible tells us there is no one righteous, no, not one. And of course, the one exception they give to that is God himself and Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the righteous one. And if he is the only one righteous, then he is the only one that will ever live, for he did not sin. 
And yet he died and took upon our sins as only he could. He took, his sins, took our sins upon himself that we might be justified through faith in him. That, Lord, we thank you that you look upon us. You do not see our guilt. We need not be weighed down by our guilt, our shame, our misdeeds. But we confess them to you freely and know that we live by faith in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.